Inequality is, uh, I think you would probably all agree, one of the great issues of our time. Uh, and we have got probably, in fact, more than probably, almost certainly, some of the most distinguished voices in this debate uh, with me here. Before we start all of that, a practical consideration. We are going to ask you to vote in this session. So I just want to alert you, rather than looking at me on those screens, uh, to a website where you will be able to vote, weth.ch forward slash vote. And the um, motion that we will be voting on, but I will open it in a second, is promoting inclusive growth calls for more emphasis on access to opportunities and less on redistribution. And we will ask you at the beginning of the session whether, you're in, whether you agree with that, and we will ask you again at the end whether you agree with that. Um, why do we care about inequality? It seems almost unnecessary to ask that question, but I just wanted to set the scene a little bit uh, with a sense of the scale of what we are facing right now. Over the last 25, 30 years, the combination of globalization and particularly technical change has meant that in many countries of the world, the gap, the income gap between those at the top and the bottom has widened dramatically. I think it's figures from the OECD that say the top 10% of people in OECD countries now are nine times that of the bottom 10% and it used to be seven. Uh, there are, this is also not just an issue within the OECD. Whether it's China, whether it's India, whether it's many countries in Africa, inequality has been widening. In fact, the majority of people in the world live in countries where inequality has been widening. At the same time, of course, global inequality has narrowed as poor countries have grown faster. But it is nonetheless an enormous issue uh, in many countries. And I think it is very likely to continue. The technological innovation that we're seeing at the moment, whether it's the fourth industrial revolution, as you claim at the WEF, or the third, which uh, uh, whichever industrial revolution you're in, um, there is increasing pace of technological change that is likely to mean more goes to those winners at the top. And in slow growing economies, that means slow growth coupled with rising inequality mathematically means the median incomes and below stagnate or shrink. This has economic consequences. For a long time, there was a debate about whether inequality was good or bad for growth. I think increasingly economists are coming down on the side that it is bad for growth. It makes growth more precarious, more fragile. The OECD and the IMF have done some interesting work on that. And it clearly has political consequences. Many countries now, we see the issue of inequality, opportunity, stagnant median wages on the political agenda. I'm struck, actually, in the United States, where in the last presidential election, it was really not on the agenda. And in this presidential election, it is absolutely on the agenda on both sides. So there's agreement that it is an issue. There is not agreement, I think, on what should be done about it and where the emphasis should be on how this challenge should be addressed. And to caricature slightly, there is one set of people that says the emphasis should be on improving equality of opportunity, and we will discuss what that means. And there is another set who says no part of the solution, or if you're extreme, most of the solution involves redistribution. And that's what we're going to debate today. We're not going to debate the existence of inequality. We're not going to debate the consequences thereof. We are going to debate what is the right way to try and promote inclusive growth. So before I introduce my panel, why don't you all start voting now? So to remind you, the promotion of inclusive growth calls for more emphasis on access to opportunity and less on redistribution. So while I introduce the panelists, perhaps you could vote. Actually, you guys don't need any introduction, but just in case you don't know, to my right here is Joe Stiglitz, professor at Columbia University, author of several books on inequality, Nobel laureate, uh, one of the most, I would say, high-profile voices on one side of this debate. To his right, Christia Freeland, Minister of Trade for Canada, and uh, author before that, when she was a mere journalist like me, uh, of Plutocrats, probably the, an extraordinarily good book on the whole inequality debate. Ricardo Hausmann, director of the Center for International Development at Harvard University, one of the most distinguished analysts of international economics and international social change. I think that's... Have you written a book on inequality? If you have, I've missed yes. it, and I apologize. You probably have. You've written so many books. Um, Anne Falgoria, Secretary General of the OECD, an organization that has done an enormous amount of work on this. What is the latest uh, book? The, the, the OECD started with 
inequality with a question mark Growing at the end. Growing unequal with a question mark? Growing unequal. Then it was divided. Divided we, we stand. We, and now it's... Why inequality keeps rising, and this one is in it together. Why less inequality benefits all. So there you see the evolution of official thinking. <laughs> <laughs> And, and here the we have is all on board inclusive growth. Here we have Richard Sammons, managing board member at the World Economic Forum, who will also offer his perspective. So with that, what is the mood of the room? Let us see. Can we have the results of the voting, please? 60 I have very short eyesight. So someone 65-35. So if 65% of you think that it calls for more emphasis on opportunity, but over a third of you think it calls for more emphasis on redistribution. So there you go, 65-35. Let's see what happens at the end of this discussion. Uh, why don't we start, Angel, with you? Uh, thank you. Uh, let me uh, say that uh, it's like Sophie's choice in a way, but uh, then uh, I would tend to slide with the majority, being a Democrat. Uh, uh, the promotion of inclusive growth calls for more emphasis on access to opportunities than on redistribution. Uh, redistribution important, but uh, promoting access to opportunities should be our first port of call because redistribution is a palliative. We're starting with a focus on reducing inequality of opportunity offers a means of actually curing the patient rather than just taking away the headache. Now, in curing the patient should be at the top of every government to-do list. Inequality has been called many things, but the latest is the defining issue, the defining challenge uh, for our future. Uh, and Zaini mentioned this, uh, you know, the income of the 10% poorest fit 10 times in the income of the 10% richest. And the problem is, so what? So is it big or small or whatever? Well, it used to be seven a generation ago. So it increased by 30 to 40% in one generation, clearly moving too fast, clearly in the wrong direction, accelerated by the crisis, obviously. Uh, now, wealth inequality even higher. You know, we've just been told about some of the numbers, the 1%, the 62, the 62 right. people with half equal to 3.5 billion, et cetera, which makes it even worse. But inequality is not just about assets. It seeps into every uh, area of people's lives. It's about jobs, health, educational attainment. The better off everywhere report better health. They live longer lives, uh, clearly uh, better lives, benefit from greater access, to the job opportunities, so equalizing the opportunities is, is even more difficult because they, the ones that are better off already are better off in terms of access to, to opportunities uh, themselves. So to be blunt, we live in a world where your initial conditions matter a lot to determine when you end up. Now, that reminds us about the, 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 the where is your uh, code, you know, your, your postal code, and therefore will determine what your future is going to be. Taken to an extreme, this is, this is a little bit of this kind uh, of problem. Prominent cause of untold wasted potential. Uh, it hurts us all by dragging down productivity and growth. And, and I have to say, the fact that inequality hinders growth is not intuitive, is not a moral or ethical uh, or even political question. We've measured it and we've compared it and we benchmarked it. And we followed these numbers, and it's taking away, it's chipping away at growth every single day. As inequality grows, and the Gini grows in every single country, et cetera, and all the, then the growth is being affected in, in all these countries. Inequality of opportunity, we should focus as our priority. Uh, it, it fosters a number of synergies in different areas. Um, early uh, childhood education, absolutely critical to take a look. Preventive health measures, again, absolutely critical, 10 to 1 benefit. It's almost a cliche now. Spend $1 now, you'll save you know, $10 later in terms of treatments. A flex security approach to labor markets, a, a flexible labor force, uh, both uh, where they're both protected but also uh, uh, are, uh, can be reskilled. Reskilling, upskilling, you know, uh, is, is absolutely critical, particularly when you're talking about the fourth industrial revolution and the impact of, of technology. There's a problem also productivity differential between firms, and that is also important because then 
the question of equality and equality will depend on whether you are in one of those firms which is on the leading edge or whether you are in one of those firms which may be destined to close or disappear or whether you are part of the workforce that because your company did not upskill you and, and, and reskill you enough, then you were the object and you were the victim of the increases in technology where you we were part of the 40% that is, that is threatened by progress. Uh, there are a number also of the trade-offs, trade-offs, trade-offs. This is also uh, another key question. Uh, when you're talking about redistribution, the question of the trade-offs does not become uh, very obvious, uh, but the question of trade-offs is very important. See, when you take one decision, how does it affect and it is a permanent uh, impact uh, or not? Uh, uh, let me also say when talking about leveling the playing field, uh, the question of taxes and the tax system uh, is uh, absolutely critical. Uh, and again, when you have the inequalities, uh, the answer to the inequalities, which has been documented and has been uh, very clearly established as a fact and a threat and a problem, the answer has to be inclusive growth. That has to be the way forward. Uh, we even had this, I was telling you, this, this discussion about whether we could call inclusive productivity uh, what we're going to be doing. We got into a terrible discussion at the OECD. We're still having that discussion going on because half of the members said absolutely unacceptable, half said it is brilliant, best thing ever. Uh, this is like a green growth. You know, they go together, they go well. And some, the, some of the technical people, the staff are half are, are divided. But, you know, because it's so divisive, you feel it's kind of a promising that uh, something <laughs> good can come out of it. Um, the... Every segment of society has to buy into this question of opportunities. When we launch our uh, inclusive growth, uh, we're now having mayors, we're having private sector, we're having, of course, government, uh, even having some you know, champions that are friends of the inclusive growth uh, concept uh, going forward. Uh, uh, but uh, I would say uh, emphasize the equality of the access uh, to the opportunities. We believe that has more promise, as I said, redistribution has to be a fact in the policies every day, but we believe the leading edge, if you have to choose between the two, if you ever have a stark choice, you know, 100% of one or 100% of the other, no doubt I go with uh, opportunities rather than redistribution. Thank you. That was a, uh, a robust uh, explanation for that view. I think two things in particular, you argue that uh, redistribution is a palliative, whereas you are offering a cure, and it is one with no trade-offs, whereas redistribution has trade-offs. Uh, are, are, our debaters are sat on opposite sides. Uh, Joe Stiglitz, I'm going to give you the floor now. Um, you are going to argue, I gather, in favor of more distribution. Well, I'm actually uh, going to argue that the question is not very well posed. Uh, and I would, if, you, if, you, if you had asked me, I would not have posed the question. Let, let me begin by, by pointing out, actually, there's a third thing that I've emphasized in my last book which is that uh, we call it pre-distribution. It's the inequality in market income. And the real disturbing thing of what's happened over the last third of a century is the increase in inequality in market incomes. So what is striking, and uh, Vice President Biden talked about this last night, is that over the last third, uh, third of a century, uh, productivity has, of workers, has almost doubled. Wages have basically stagnated. This is a new kind of economics. Uh, it used to be that when productivity increased, wages increased in tandem. Suddenly, or you know, over the last 35 years, we rewrote the rules of the market economy in ways that led to a less productive economy and more inequality. And that is what has opened up that gap. And so if I were to say what is the most important thing, it's to rewrite the rules to, get, to, to, to improve the market distribution of income. It's important because one of the reasons that there's such uh, unhappiness today with inequality is partly the way it's generated. It's felt to be unfair. It's, it's, it's evidence of something's wrong with our economic system. And we, you know, productivity goes up, and workers are saying we're not getting a fair share. But then, to the point the, of the trade-off issue, the point is these rewriting of the rules 
to increase inequality have actually decreased economic performance. So in fact, I would go, I'd go even further by rewriting the rules to get more equality, we would get a more productive economy. Just to give you one example, one of the things that we've done over the last third of a century is rewrite the rules in, uh, which have encouraged short-term thinking, uh, which have encouraged uh, um, uh, the result of that short-term thinking is firms don't invest as much in workers, they don't invest as much uh, in, in capital and technology. A striking thing about what's happened since the crisis of 2008, we've, central banks have pumped in gazillions of dollars of money into the system. Investment hasn't increased at all. It's actually decreased as a share. So these are all evidence that our economic system isn't working. And then you have to ask why it's not working for a majority of our citizens, a few people at the top are doing very well, but for the majority of our citizens not working, you have to ask why. Growth more recently, in the, since the last 35 years, has been lower than in the decades after World War II when we had shared prosperity. And the reason is we rewrote the rules in order to, to uh, in ways that uh, led to less opportunity, less long-term economic performance, and more inequality. So that's my first point. The, the um, second uh, point is that, in fact, you can't really get in any society equality of opportunity without redu uh, uh, a certain degree of equality uh, of income. Uh, inevitably, when you have the gaps as large as they are in the United States and some of the other advanced countries, uh, they get translated into inequalities of opportunity. And in fact, uh, there's a very strong relationship that's been shown between inequality of income and wealth on the one hand, inequality of opportunity. So if you are concerned about inequality of opportunity, and I think you should be, I'm, I'm strongly, you know, I can't disagree with anything that you said, except the last su summary sentence, um, the, <laughs> that uh, if you are concerned about equality of opportunity, you have to be concerned with equality of outcome, uh, inequality of income, inequal yeah. uh, e equality of wealth. Uh, anyway, these are just the facts. And there's, if you want to understand the mechanisms by which there's this intergenerational transmission of me a mechanism across generations of inequality, if you want to understand the mechanisms by which uh, our societies have wound up with so much inequality, they are so intimately connected that you have to actually address both. I guess the third point I uh, would make um, is um, that uh, when we talk about redistribution, one has the sense that you're taking uh, a lot of money away from the people at the top and uh, moving it down to the bottom. A lot of what I think, you know, I, if we just had a fair tax system that taxed the people at the top that made multinational corporations pay taxes, we, we wouldn't need a, 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 a more redistribution. The real problem today is, in the United States, I'm talking, because I know that data better, we have a regressive tax system. The people at the top pay tax rate of 15%, uh, uh, when people much lower down are paying 30% or more. And uh, uh, the, the uh, multinationals uh, are escaping taxation. So th they don't pay. And, and OECD has had an uh, uh, important effort called BEPS to uh, close the loopholes. Uh, Angel knows I've been a little bit critical that they haven't gone far enough, but he agrees with uh, that there is a lot more that needs to be done, but it was an important and impressive uh, first start. But here again, what I'd argue is uh, there's not a trade-off uh, because our regressive tax system is very distortionary and is lower economic growth. When you tax land speculation at a lower rate than you tax work, it distorts the economy. I've seen no evidence anywhere in economics that taxing land at a lower rate leads to more land. Um, 
And so the supply <laughs> elasticity, you know, so, so the, the point is a more fair system would actually lead to more economic growth. So again, uh, no trade-off, in fact, positive. Uh, finally, uh, the IMF studies have shown that the critical variable uh, in determining the uh, growth is the inequality, the final inequality, you know, what you get at the end. And partly, I suppose, that's, you know, so the evidence is, this macroeconomic evidence, is that the redistribution doesn't have the negative effects that one might have thought, partly because of some of the reasons I've just described. But their evidence is very much in that, in terms of that this new thinking about equality is good for growth. What it shows is that the real variable that you want to focus on is the final, what you get at the end. But it's, you know, my own feeling is it's much better to begin by getting a, a fair distribution of income, more opportunity, and then you have less burden on redistribution. That was another very powerful uh, <laughs> intervention in the opposite direction. Let me let me briefly summarize it. So one is that you can't get in a, you can't get equality of opportunity without equality of outcome. Secondly, that re it's not about redistribution; it's about simply creating uh, an equal playing field in the tax system, and that, that is there's no trade-off there. That that is pro-growth. And thirdly, that it's about pre-distribution. That was the new concept you introduced. That actually the rules of the game in capitalism have been rigged. Well, you didn't say this, but I'm assuming you mean away from labor towards capital, and that that pre-distribution has to be addressed. Uh, very, very interesting. I wonder if that's going to have affected anybody's views. Ricardo, your turn. Okay, so let me start by saying that uh, I may differ on some things, not too many, with Joe, uh, well, but in part of it because Joe is, is somewhat focused on U.S. inequality, and I think that the issue of inequality in the U.S. is slightly different from two other issues. One is inequality at the global level. And inequality at the global level, say the US is at $60,000 of income per capita, India is at $1,600 of income per capita. Why are these huge differences in income per capita between countries? It is differences in productivity. It is not differences in schooling, by the way. I mean, the evidence is very clear that it's not differences in schooling, that those are not large enough to explain these huge differences. It's differences in productivity. When you look in the developing world, the inequality in the developing world, in the studies I've done suggest that there's enormous inequality in productivity within countries. While in the US, the richest state is about twice as rich as the poorest state, in Mexico, Nuevo Leon is nine times richer than Chiapas. So there's huge differences in productivity within countries and even across within states, between, within cities and so on. So I, the inequality I care most about is inequality in productivity. Because inequality in productivity is lose-lose. Is you are using people in very unproductive ways that don't produce much for anybody else, that if they just could be as productive as the people at the top, we would get more output and more equality. So inequality in productivity is, I think, a, the, the source of problem that we should address. Now, why do we get these broad distributions of productivity? Why is there so much inequality in productivity? I would say it's because to be productive, you need many things. You need places where workers can go in and out. Power is there. Water is there. The logistics work. There's a, a variety of skills in the labor force that can go to work and go back. There's commute times and so on. So it's places that are productive. And if you look across the country, there are very few places that can be productive, where productive act activity can happen in an efficient way. So you have these places that are high productivity places, and then everywhere is low productivity place. Now, why do we observe this? We observe this because many of these inputs that you have to put in place have some fixed cost of putting them in place, and then very low variable cost. You know, it takes some money to put a wire into a house, but then, you know, switching the light is a, is a low cost thing. So these fixed costs cannot be borne in by poor people. So we don't connect poor people or poor areas because they cannot pay the fixed cost. But if we don't connect them, they'll be unproductive and hence poor. So we get these productivity traps because we have not included people into the ecosystem, into the network that would have made them productive. So 
countries, governments are facing the following trade-off. They can put some of all of these inputs everywhere, so everybody democratically gets a little bit of everything, or some of everything, or you can put all of these things somewhere. Now, if you put a little of these things everywhere, you get nothing everywhere. So what ends up happening is you get all of these things somewhere, and then you have growth there and not everywhere else, so that people are left behind. And you measure ex post, you measure these rising inequalities. So the inequalities are not really in the sharing of the pie. It's inequalities in the sizes of the pie. In places, sizes are very small because it's very hard to be productive there. In other places, the, size, the pies are, are very large, and capital and labor can share on, on that much larger pie. So what I think is called for is to find ways to, to, um, to lessen this trade-off of putting a few things everywhere versus everything somewhere. So it, ways in which we can share in the cost of connecting people or of including people, uh, whether it's, you know, that will involve uh, changes in the way we urbanize, in the places we put housing, in the places we connect people to the possibility of going to work. In Latin America, for example, it's typical to have two-hour commute times to go to work, two hours to come back. A, you know, a daycare center so that women can uh, participate in the labor force, and so on. So there's a long list of things that we need to do to have more inclusive, productive societies. And these things cost public resources. And I think that the best way to fund this is with a progressive tax system. But the reason why we want this progressive taxation is to have the resources with which we're going to include people in higher productivity activities. That's a very weaselly shift to the other side, I may say. Uh, but a very interesting point, the fact that there's a focus on the geography of inequality and the need for investment and infrastructure across a broader area funded by a progressive tax system. Uh, Christia, what's your take on this? Okay, well, um, I uh, spend my days in a Westminster-style parliament of democracy, so I can't help but start with a rebuttal. Gentlemen, both of you have made my argument and Joe's. You've talked about how terrible the inequality of opportunity is. You've outlined, I think, some very wise and smart things we need to do to change it. And those things cost money. And that money we get by redistribution. So really, I should stop talking right now. Um, look, I think we need to begin the argument uh, or the discussion by acknowledging a real irony that all of us partake of, which is we are having this debate about income inequality at Davos. Uh, this is a discussion within the 1%, and some of the rooms we'll be in this week is within the 0.1%. We all have a vested interest here, and I think we need to really acknowledge that. And so I wasn't at all surprised to find that 65% were in favor of access to opportunity versus this slightly more touching my personal interests idea called redistribution. Um, so please do think about that. And also please realize Joe and I are not daunted by those odds. My party was in third place in the polls in <laughs> August. We won a thumping majority two and a half months later. So let's see if Joe and I can do that in 10 minutes. Um, I want to start by really putting a little bit of data behind Joe's point about taxation. Um, when we talk about redistribution today in 2016, we need to do that from a perspective that really acknowledges the extent to which the tax system since the Second World War has really shifted away from the top. In 1963, in the United States, corporate taxes accounted for 25% of government revenues. Today, it's 10% and falling. The top marginal tax rate in the United States in 1965, what, or 1963, sorry, it was 65, the corporate one, in 1963 was 91%. This is the United States. Now, not only are the headline rates much, much lower today, but as Joe said, the actual rates are really, really low. Warren Buffett likes to say he pays taxes at a lower rate than his secretary, and he's right. We know the actual data of one very successful, very wealthy American, a guy called Mitt Romney. He released his 2010 tax returns, and when he did that, we learned that in 2010, he learned, earned $21 million. He paid $3 million in taxes. 
that's a tax rate of 13.9%. So when you're talking about redistribution in the age of income inequality, bear that in mind. There's another factor that I think is really important to think about when we think about this, and it's something that Zanny is a longtime friend of mine and colleague, former colleague. Uh, she's not in the Canadian cabinet yet. Um, but, and she gave a great introduction. And I think without intending to, she hit on a point which is core to my thinking about this, which is the winner-take-all nature of what Klaus Schwab calls the fourth industrial revolution, what I in my book often talk about as the impact of globalization, the technology revolution. And I think we really need to start grappling with, it's not just a possibility, the fact that the way the 21st century economy is working is to tend to concentrate much, much more of the rewards at the very top with the people who are, yes, really, really smart, really, really hardworking, really, really lucky, and much less at the bottom. So let me give you one number to focus on how that process is working. In the 1950s, Detroit was the Silicon Valley of the United States. GM, just one company there, employed 600,000 people. Today, Google and Facebook together employ 60,000. That tells you how this new economy is working and why it is creating, when it works, when it is successful, it is creating a more unequal society. So I want to be really clear. I am not for a nanosecond opposed to innovation, opposed to equality of opportunity, opposed to success and wealth creation. I'm Canada's trade minister, you know, for gosh sakes. You know, my job here is to sell you on Canada, tell you come and invest in our fabulous country, to go out and champion Canadian exporters. But the reality is that in this fourth industrial revolution economy, income inequality is structurally built into this. You know, we look at a place like Silicon Valley, this is, I think, the world's epicenter of opportunity. You can't say there isn't opportunity there. People go from all over the world to get access to those opportunities. But it is also the epicenter, a geographic epicenter of income inequality. As a cabinet minister, I often think that there's this paradox of Silicon Valley. The only thing worse than inequality of a Silicon Valley is not having a Silicon Valley in your own country. So given that, we do have to grapple with the reality that we need some redistribution. I know that Joe and I are arguing the less pleasant side of this debate. Access to opportunity, this is the milk and motherhood of talking about income inequality. No one is opposed to it. I'm not opposed to it either. It's fabulous and it's easy to champion. But I think we all need to confront the fact, and we, like, we're all the winners in the winner-take-all economy. That's why we're here. And we need to really face up to the fact that if we want to live in communities, in societies of inclusive growth, redistribution is an important part of what we need to do. Now, you might accuse me. You might say, oh, Christy, you know, you're just an idealistic writer. This is politically not possible. You could have said that to me two years ago. But of everyone seated here, I'm the only person who actually needs to get people to vote for her. And three months ago, I was knocking on doors. Uh, in Canada, cabinet ministers are also members of parliament. I represent a district called University Rosedale. This is one of the wealthiest communities, probably the wealthiest community in Canada. I was knocking on people's doors with a campaign platform that said, we are going to raise taxes on the 1%. Meaningfully. I won. I won 50% of the vote, and the Conservatives, who were calling for lower taxes, won 17.5. Now, this shows me that Canadians are great, <laughs> but no, it also shows me, and I'll tell you what I said to people at the door, because people said to me, you know, I want to vote for you, but actually, it's going to cost me $30,000 if you win. How can I do this? It's a really expensive vote. And what I said was, societies right now have a big choice to make. Do you want to live in a society, in a community, in a country of inclusive prosperity, where you're doing well, but your neighbors are too? Or do you want to live in a gated community 
of the 1% or the 0.1%. If you want to live in a society of inclusive prosperity, you have to accept that the winners in the winner-take-all economy need to share. It's called redistribution. So please be smart, like the voters of University Rosedale, and support me and Joe. <laughs> that was interesting. A, a compelling argument from the right honorable member from Rosedale. Uh, redistribution is important. Redistribution, and you can, you can advocate redistribution and still win votes. Uh, the economy has become more of a winner-takes-all economy. The, the shift of power has moved away from labor to capital, echoing some of, of Joe's points. Uh, before we go op open to a general discussion, Richard, from your vantage point, you at the WEF have looked at this from the, from the Davos perspective. What would you like to add to the debate? Well, first, I'd like to um, generally congratulate the panelists for being good sports and, and arguing their brief although there was certainly some wiggling there going on <laughs> here and there. But uh, I think you know, we, we framed the session. Uh, you know, this was a vehicle for discussion. I think all of the, the panelists would agree that this is essentially a false choice. And uh, the arguments brought that out. You have the organizers of the debate saying that that is <laughs> But, but let, me, uh, let, me, let me break this down a little bit. Um, if you go back uh, in some time and you take a look at um, what happened in East Asia, where you had some very poor countries that had a several decades of very rapid growth. The World Bank, uh, some 20 or so years ago, and, and Joe Stiglitz was the chief economist of the World Bank, they did a very rigorous study about what were the ingredients of East Asia's success in achieving high growth with equity. Those countries grew fast, but the equity did not suffer. And they concluded that essentially uh, I, I use the word institutions and frameworks, you use the, the term rules, that they did a lot of the right things on the efficiency side of the equation, but they also did a number of things in institutional frameworks, policy incentives and rules, and public-private uh, labor management relations and whatnot, and good public administration to avoid the ability of vested interests to capture policy decision-making that had the, had the combined effect of actually delivering high growth with equity. Similarly, if you look back at the history of industrialized countries, the US, North America, Europe, and others, they learned out of the ashes of the stock market uh, crash in the 20s and early 30s that they needed to change their model of economic growth. And they instituted over a series of decades, in the, in the post-war period in particular, but certainly in the New Deal in the United States, bef even starting before the war, a range of financial system corporate governance, labor institution, uh, antitrust rules, even environmental, uh, labor market uh, institutions, public education systems, huge infrastructure spending, a whole lattice of national economic institution building, not just in the areas which economists normally talk about as structural reform, and there they're usually referring to efficiency en enhancing measures, but in a range of other areas. And those, that set of reforms that broad spectrum of economic institution building, or rules deepening, if, if you want to use uh, uh, your language, had the, had the effect of creating uh, both growth and uh, larger improvements in median progress in living standards. And that had a mutually reinforcing effect. We have forgotten, over the last 30 years or so, the model. We used to have uh, a more inclusive economic growth model. So what we at the forum have done, listening to the debate, feeling that it has been largely too much, I would not say necessarily largely, a false choice, too much polemics, too narrow, very quickly focused on uh, education and redistribution as the sole issues. Those are absolutely very important levers that can be pulled as part of a national strategy to remedy the situation. But actually, if you go back and look at scholarship, including the Growth Commission, some years ago, as well as the East Asian and the, the Western experience, there are 15 different areas of economic institutions that have a, a dual purpose. They have a growth and a broad-based progress and living standards purpose. And let me give you a couple of illustrations of this. And the problem is the debate has been a little bit too general, conceptual, even sometimes polemical. And we put together a cross-country database of spanning 110 countries, 140 different indicators across these 15 different areas that, that do essentially what a business would do when they're trying to figure out how, how to improve, is they see what 
the other, the other guys have been doing. And you cross, we, we, we enable a very clean cross-country comparison with peers. And that, that opens up a discussion where you see what levers you're relatively weak in, where you haven't fully utilized your policy space relative to the experience of other countries. And it's, it's that discussion where you get a little bit out of the 30,000 foot and you get down a little bit closer to the ground, which we feel is the basis for turning the debate toward what's actionable. And the interesting thing is if you look at it, if you, you take anti-corruption, rents, or anti-competitive anti business practice, this is not ordained. You can have an influence on that. You can, you can institute anti-corruption types of institutions and frameworks. You can improve your rules to avoid rent seeking that have an effect. That's, that's his, his point. Infrastructure is one of the most employment intensive types of investment, public and private, that can be the case. Again, a dual, a dual win there. The way you set up your financial system, how well it, it uh, intermediates the savings in the country for real economy, real uh, business capital formation, as opposed to investment in real estate, which is really exchanges of assets. It's not net new capital formation, let alone uh, to other transfers of financial assets and speculation and the like. Th that's affected by rules. It's, it's not ordained. So what I would do is simply say in, in summation here is that uh, contrary to some of the analyses that's contributed to some of the polemics, this is an issue that can be worked. It can be broken down in very practical ways, and you can surmount the fa false choice. And moreover, you can, you can achieve uh, a deepening and a greater resilience of growth. It's very often a matter of a resilience and a sustainability of the growth that we're talking about here. At the same time, that you do what the, po what the populations are asking of us, and that is to focus not on the GDP per growth per capita growth numbers, which I call a top line indicator of national economic uh, performance. And you can really start focusing on what you can do to drive what I call bottom line economic performance, which is the rate of broad-based progress in living standards. Well, that I think drilling down into the details of how you do that is part of what we'll do in the next 20 minutes or so, where I think we will, we will move away from the pro con too much, but you will so we'll focus on, I think, three areas, and I'm going to open up to audience questions and, and comments too, but I think there is three big areas that we need to delve in further, two on your side of the debate and one of yours. And in the interest of uh, you know, doing what journalists do, simplifying, exaggerating, and provoking, uh, <laughs> I think the question with, there is one area we need to talk about, this whole idea of pre-distribution, changing the rules of the game, what do you actually mean and are there really no trade-offs? Secondly, on redistribution, what do you really want? You can redistribute through the spending system, you can redistribute through the tax code. The Europeans overall much more redistributive than the Americans do it all through the spending side. The, the tax code is actually VAT dominated and very regressive in Europe. So where do you want that? And on your side, uh, everyone agrees that promoting inequality equality of opportunity is good. But isn't it just motherhood and apple pie? And the evidence that you cited about education not really explaining the gaps in income presumably suggests that education isn't really a complete answer either. So we'll all agree that equality of opportunity is a good idea, but what do you really focus on? So why don't we start with the, possibly the most contentious uh, redistribution? Joe, and actually Christian, both of you, the debate always is about, people say we need more redistribution to pay for, we need to pay for all of these things, has to be progressive, let's raise tax rates at the top. Why is that the best thing to do? Well, can I just say, what I emphasized was, it wasn't uh, uh, making the system, right now the real problem is we have a regressive tax system and a distortionary tax system. We could raise a lot of revenue just by eliminating those distortions and the regressivity. So when Krista mentioned that Romney paid 13.9%, that was of his reported income. Um, and I, I don't mean that he was violating the law. The, the law itself says you don't pay taxes on capital gains until they're realized. And, that gives, and you, realize, you have incentive to realize losses and not to realize gains. So, so the net effect of this in terms of what, our, what economists would call real incomes is the change in your, in your economic position is much more lower. I mean, the system is much more regressive. Uh, so if we eliminated that regressivity, if we taxed capital gains at just ordinary rates, 
as they accrue, uh, if we didn't give all these other kinds of special benefits, we would go a long way to get a fairer economic system. In addition to that, I, I would actually think that we could have a progressive, uh, a more Do progressive. Do you think higher marginal tax rates at the top are an important part of the U.S. agenda? Yes, but what I'm saying is, okay. even before we get there, we have a lot to go just to have a fair tax system, which is not regressive. Christia, why did your government or your party choose to have a higher marginal tax rate on the 1% as being the route to greater redistribution? Well, we didn't say it was the route, um, but we believe that income inequality is real, that it's happening, and that it's a drag on economic growth. And look, we're just getting started. We've only been in government now for 10 weeks since we were sworn in. Um, but our tax proposal, which we've already started to implement, um, was basically in three parts. Um, one part was raising taxes on precisely on the 1%. Uh, if you earn more than $217,000 in Canada, your tax rate is going to go up. Uh, we used that revenue to cut taxes on the middle tranche of income from forty-four dollars to $89,000 because our belief is those people are the hardest hit and you know by all of these forces we've been talking about and we wanted them to have more money in their pockets. And then the final thing um, that we have said we're going to do and we're just I implementing the legislation uh, is to alter our child benefit system to put more money in it. Um, and to skew the money much more towards people at the bottom. And this actually is something very important to me. What we're going to do once we finish implementing this is effectively we'll have a guaranteed annual income for Canadian children. So every Canadian family, every Canadian child, well, their parents, um, will get at least $6,500, and that's what economists say is the minimum amount you need to be above the poverty line. We think that's really important to this equal access to opportunity agenda, but it does take tax revenue to pay for it. What is the top marginal rate of tax in Canada now? Um, what is it right now? Well, once, once with this increase that you've proposed. With our current increase, it will be, well, I can't give you a full answer. I'm not being a politician here um, because it depends on the provincial rate. Okay. But so, and different provinces uh, have different rates. So it will, in some provinces, go to above 50%. To go above 50%. Now, is there anybody in the audience who'd like to offer a comment or a question or uh, address, particularly on this redistribution? I see. Yes, gentleman here. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, my name's Rob Davies. I'm actually also a politician. I'm a. I'm a Minister of Trade Industry of South Africa. Comrade. Uh, a comrade, yeah, hi. I, I want to just say I mean, very briefly, I think up on the side that says that uh, it's got to be redistribution, it's got to be redistribution of opportunity, but also of, of outcome. I, I'm, I'm on that side. Uh, what I wanted to raise was, was, was two points. One was if you look at Professor Schwab's book, which has been handed around to all of us here, he's got a, a couple of pages, and he's saying that, as you said when you introduced, you said the inequality is within countries, within social categories, not, uh, and, and there's been a reduction of inequality between countries. He says the fourth industrial revolution could create exactly the opposite. So I wonder whether everyone would comment on that. It's about things like the new technologies would lead to reshoring, uh, relocation of industrial opportunities, that kind of stuff. So I wonder if they'd want to comment on that, because I think that would be another dimension. And then the other one is to say that I think that uh, a, a lot of of the, you know, the, I, I agree with Professor Stiglitz. It's tax administration rather than tax rates in many cases. Uh, this stuff about uh, transfer pricing, uh, you know, uh, base erosion, profit shifting is now a major global industry. And, uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, in our country, for example, I used to be the chair of our finance committee at one stage in Parliament. And I said, how many people here are working uh, to try to avoid, uh, you know, to try to deal with tax avoidance? and tax evasion, in fact, in some cases. 
And they said, well, there's about, you know, 50 of us. And I said, well, and how many people are advising these companies? They said, well, you know, there would be several companies and each of them would have uh, multiples of that who are advising people precisely on how to, 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 to break the rules and get out of this. And that's, and that's a very major issue. I know that the OECD has introduced guidelines and things like that, but I actually think that the truth is that these are way behind the curve, way behind what we need. And these are, these are quite fundamental questions right now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Ricardo to respond to the idea. What do you make of this argument that technological change could in fact start to raise inequalities between countries? Do any of you agree with that? Ricardo, you go first, and then if anybody else wants to chime in. Well, um, I think that the jury is still out. It will, uh, first of all, I'm not sure that within countries, uh, the manufacturing sector is kind of like big enough to change uh, the income distribution that you know, it represents less than 15% of employment, the things that are going to happen there, I don't know that they'll impact very significant, or that they'll be the dominant determinant of what will happen to income distribution. But I do think that uh, whether uh, this uh, new revolution increases the opportunity of countries to participate in the global economy or makes it harder for the countries to participate in the global economy is an open question. And it will probably be depend on how this technology deploys and how, and how do countries adapt to it. Uh, so, so I think the jury is still out. Could, uh, uh, so earlier this week, we put out a, a new piece of uh, survey work where we surveyed about 350 big companies around the world, 13 million employees, and asking them their view of where the job market's going to be heading in the next five, 10 years or so. And the aggregate numbers, this is survey work, uh, the aggregate numbers were they thought that the tech aspect of this probably will result in a net loss of about five million jobs. But that's just within that dynamic. The larger question is what's the growth impact, which may create opportunity and jobs elsewhere. But let, let me just say part of the reason, part of the reason we, we launched this type of work is because the companies, the CEOs of the, of the companies, for the last couple of years have been having, been having a discussion about what they're concerned about. And this is one of the things they're most concerned about that there could be some significant employment effects of, of these kinds of transformations. And they feel that potentially, unless we get very practical and move beyond the, you know, the more conceptual aspects of this debate, that uh, public support for uh, smart pro-market types of policies may evaporate. And we've got a trade minister sitting right here, and this is partly what has happened uh, in the trade field. So they're very prepared. My, just the, the last comment I'll make here is that I think they're prepared to take a more pragmatic view about the, they understand, uh, as we discussed with them, that you need a mix. That's why this is a false choice. You need a mix of some of the fiscal transfer and redistribution aspects of, of this, and what you call the pre-distribution aspects. The countries will differ. And the U.S. actually, the big problems are not so much on its tax system, but it has very weak fiscal transfers. And it has big problems. It's 29th out of 29 advanced countries on perceptions of whether vested interests uh, capture policy and, and, uh, and perpetuate rents. Thank you. There. Yeah, I'm going to, if you could be very brief, Joe, because I'd quite like to get another couple oh, of questions in. We're going to run out of time. Here's my point, uh, that uh, a lot of the re uh, uh, sourcing coming back won't solve the, uh, will undermine the grow, uh, the re redu reduction in inequality across countries, it will be, but it won't help the inequality within the United States. The, uh, the resourcing will be high-tech apparel manufactured robots. Uh, that's not gonna create the jobs that are, are lost in South Carolina. And uh, uh, Ricardo is absolutely right that Manufacturing is relatively small, can have still a big effect. But the same kind of logic will apply for the surface sector, where, again, that same kind of process will be going on. Another comment. Yes, gentleman there, and then there's one over there, too. Uh, Federico Rivas. I'm a global shaper from the San Salvador hub. Uh, Professor Hausman, you mentioned that income inequality is really a difference in productivity. And in a region like Latin America, we all know what a $25 tablet with an app like Duolingo teaching English in a rural village does uh, and can exponentially increment the productivity of an entire household. So um, could you give us an example of uh, how can, can a favorable policy that uh, install input multipliers uh, instead of redistributing wealth in order to gain more access to opportunities in a developing region like ours? 
Well, I mean, this is a, a, an excellent point of what happens when technology is able to diffuse so that people can become more productive. Let me make a comment on the education story. It's very easy to, to do, actually. You know, we have, for example, the, in the US, there's this um, a lottery system for visas. And you know, people have gone and asked the question, what happened to the people who won the lottery versus the people who lost the lottery with very similar characteristics? And if you go to the US, your income per capita goes up by multiples. If you stay home, it doesn't. And it's your same person, the same education. What changed was not you, it's the ecosystem you're plugged into. So it's the ecosystem that's making you productive. Uh, you know, hermits are not productive. So <laughs> it, independent of their schooling. So, um, <laughs> so it is very important that we harness in these new technologies, in these new possibilities, the, the, the ability for people to connect to global opportunities by having what they need to be productive in their environment. Can you very briefly perhaps be concrete on what that implies? Because I think that was implicit yeah. in the question. What are the concrete? We all agree that that yeah. sounds wonderful. Concretely, what, how do you do that? Well, first of all, for example, do you auction a, 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 a cell phone bandwidth to the, to the, <clears throat> a, a, to the a, a highest bidder? Or do you use those resources to make sure that everybody gets access to, to cell phone technology? So is, it a, is, is, is that rent to be shared so that everybody gets connected? No. Or is it just a, a source of income for the government to be spent uh, exactly. uh, lowering taxes to somebody else? So, so how we, you know, in, in most of Latin America, we put poor people to live in the cheapest land. The cheapest land is there is cheap because it's disconnected. So we disconnect poor people through our housing policy, right? So, um, and, and I can go on and on, but essentially there are plenty of distributional issues which are in the way we organize society that allows for technology to deploy. Yeah, just to support Ricardo, you know, when we construct infra infrastructure, we don't connect poor people uh, to, to the jobs. So by the way we construct infrastructure, we change opportunity and we take away opportunity from the people who are at the bottom. Just Very briefly. Comment on, on Rob, uh, nothing is written because it depends on the policies and it depends on how the policies react to the problem. There's nothing that is automatic. And uh, one of the things we've been discussing in practically every one of the sessions, Zeekwells or whatever, panels, whatever, is this question of is tech a threat or is it an opportunity? Well, again, maybe it's a false dilemma, but if, if techs, tech allows uh, skilling because it, has, it gives you a lot of the tools that you did not have before. Now, now skilling allows to profit from the tech, and then there you go again. You know, the, and that is what you uh, need for the increase in productivity. And I would agree with our, our friend here that in many of the developing countries in particular, a little bit of tech, well applied, goes enormously, enormously far in terms of how that will increase productivity. It's, it's like, you know, when the Chinese moved from the rural areas to the, to, to the cities, you had massive increases in productivity over a relatively long period of time. It, 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 and, you know, with a steam engine and everything else. So the, the question here is, the, it's, it's about productivity. It is about, and, and the productivity differences, as Ricardo mentioned, are the ones to explain, if not all, at least most of these differences. And we've had now some concrete ways to address that. Now, very, very briefly, because I'm we're totally running out of time, a gentleman there with a quick question, and then we're, I'm going to ask you all to vote again. Hi, I'm <coughs> Tony Miller from PAG in Japan. Uh, I'm based in Japan. Uh, Japan certainly seems to have uh, made a decision as a society to sacrifice growth and perhaps even productivity and in the last 20 years of uh, lost decade has still never seen unemployment go above 5% today. It's at 3.6%. Maybe you guys are being too easy on us. Maybe there really is a decision as a society to make that maybe we should be sacrificing some growth and some productivity. You're saying that we can uh, uh, redistribute in, uh, income and have a greater uh, opportunity, even if we have greater, uh, uh, less inequality, but maybe we should we should uh, bite the bullet and uh, actually uh, accept uh, uh, less growth and less income 
uh, in return for greater uh, equality. Well, that is, that is a bracing <coughs> note to end on. Um, I was, you want to comment on that very, very briefly? Can I, I, have this, I, can I, I just say, I would like everyone to start voting, because we are going to run out of time. So the question is coming up again while you answer, Joe. This gives you guys a slight well, What I was going to say is it's a little bit mischaracterizing where Japan is, because Japan's working force has been declining. And the difference between Japan's working force and the United States is one percentage point. And if you correct for that, Japan is towards the top of the OECD league. It's not the highest skill, okay, too. Everyone can get all right. Christy, you okay, want to make a point, quick too. Quick final points, three super quick final points. I can't resist saying about Japan, try equality for women. That could be a big help. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. We have a 50-50 cabinet where our prime minister is a feminist. Um, uh, to uh, Richard's point, I think you made an incredibly important point about public support. And I am a trade minister. And I think we really have to realize that there is a very strong political aspect to everything we're talking about. If we can't figure out how to make global capitalism work for ordinary people, pretty soon they're going to start voting against global capitalism. It's a big problem. And then just finally, a big trade minister and OECD solidarity point. This point about base erosion is really essential. And in a way, when you made your point, I felt like I should have erased everything else I said. Because we live in an age of global capital and national taxation. And if we don't square that circle, no one will have a tax base. Now, in the interest of fairness, you two also get a very quick last word. Ricardo. I think that if redistribution or if progressive taxation is not in the context of inclusive growth, it can lead to a fabulous disaster. I come from Venezuela, and I don't have to say more. <laughs> redistribution does not increase and produce wealth the first time around, whereas equality of opportunities will, because it will have a direct impact on productivity. Uh, and uh, this is the reason why I think it should go first. Thank you all very much. Let's see where you all came out. The suspense. <laughs> Election night. Whoa! Okay. Well, that was certainly a surprise. I think I need to say no more. Thank you all very much for a spirited discussion.